my goal in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes, if it works out that way, is to take what um, Meg has given you about what the Synod does and then give you a sense of how the governing commission's work fits in with the work of the Synod Assembly on the one side and the work of the staff on the other side. So this is sort of the, the link in the chain, if you will. So to make sense of that, let's start with the work of the Synod Assembly itself. So at least once a year, the Synod Assembly, and, and by this I mean the gathering of the commissioners, the 38 people that are sent from the presbyteries to uh, represent the presbyteries to the Synod in, in a voting manner. Um, each year they have three categories of business to address. First, the assembly handles elections. So it elects a nominating committee who then nominates from the commissioners people to serve on the governing commission and people to serve as co-moderators. Those are um, then elected upon the nomination from the nominating committee. Second, it receives reports. So it remains apprised of budgets and financial matters. It um, hears for, from any entities that are mandated in the Book of Order, like, for instance, the Permanent Judicial Commission. And it receives an annual report from the Governing Commission indicating the results of the Governing Commission's monitoring of the Senate Executive's responsibilities. There will be more on that later. And then the third thing that the assembly itself does each year is it responds to any suggestions or questions that the governing commission has regarding the primary and secondary ends of the synod. And so it provides the um, advice and consultation around that that ultimately devolves back to the responsibilities of the assembly itself. And then the assembly delegates everything else to the governing commission. And so you see that in this quote that comes from our policy governance manual, which is um, one of our governing documents, a little higher up, if you will, than the manual of administrative operations and a little lower down, if you will, than the standing rules. It says the Senate of the Trinity establishes and delegates most of its governing responsibilities and authority to an administrative commission. This administrative commission is known, in, meaning known in the Senate of the Trinity as the governing commission, and that's who you are. And then the delegation releases the governing commission to run free with the work that needs to be done to define and refine the Synod's ends so that the Synod can do what it's here to do. So then, having received delegation of a profound amount of authority and responsibility, what does the work of the Governing Commission look like? So now what I invite you to do is reflect with me on an annual cycle of the Governing Commission in much the same way that we just looked at the annual cycle of the Senate Assembly. So in that context, the Governing Commission has, like the Assembly, three major tasks that it accomplishes each year. First, it, moder it monitors the Synod's financials. So it receives the audit report. It affirms the annual budget. It stays up to date on the balance sheet and expense income reports by way of the Synod executive. And I usually hand that off to our Synod business administrator to speak with you about those things. Then secondly, it elects the Governing Commission Personnel Committee so that a group may handle the annual evaluations and compensation questions 
with regard to the Senate executive and the stated clerk. And for the sake of avoiding confusion or at least reducing the confusion that will already have arise, arisen, um, there is also a personnel advisory team which advises me on my supervision of employees that I'm allowed to supervise. I'm not allowed to supervise the state of clerk. He answers to the synod, not to me. And I'm not allowed to supervise myself for obvious reasons. So then the Governing Commission Personnel Committee supervises us on behalf of the Governing Commission. And the, the personnel advisory team helps me in my work of supervising those other employees. And then the third thing, and the most important, I would argue, of your jobs um, as the governing commission is to conduct multiple reviews throughout the year. So you review the synod ends on a cycle throughout the year, determining whether they, as they're currently stated, continue to represent the most important emphases that the Synod can pursue in the needs of its presbyteries. You'll regularly review the executive limitations, which say what I and my staff cannot do, while then setting me free to do anything else that you haven't said I cannot do. And you'll review everything else that's also in the policy governance manual to make sure that it reflects how we want to organize our governance and our work and to make sure that it clearly reflects your relationship with me. And then you'll also review my progress toward implementing the Synod's ends and you'll review Michael's service to you as the Chief Ecclesiastical Officer of the Synod. And you'll review yourselves, your own work. Now that last one I'd like to spend an extra moment on. Um, because self-review in this case needs a little bit of clarification. And, and those of you who've been on the Governing Commission in past years, will have seen us move, moving much more intentionally in the direction of a certain kind of self-review as opposed to another kind. It's a more defined question than did our meeting go well or what do we wish had happened differently? Instead, it's a question of did we do what we are charged with doing as a group as the governing commission. So it's possible to get into specifics of how the meeting went well or badly, but only in the service of the more important question, which is, did we accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish? Did we fulfill our role? If yes, what did that look like? If no, where did we fall short and why? And the goal isn't to lay blame or set up an opportunity to complain but instead it's to create a culture within the group of continuous improvement so that each time we're doing our charge a little bit more like we're meant to than we were last time until over and over again, it becomes familiar and natural. And in fact, the common and expected way that we will be doing our work as a group as time goes forward. There's one other piece on this list under review that I want to spend a moment or two reflecting on also, and that's the section marked ends and executive limitations. So there's the ordinary review work when things seem to be moving the way they should. But there's also sort of unusual moments, or at least we hope they're unusual moments, of review work when it looks like either something I'm doing I should not be doing or something that I'm not doing I should be doing or that would be the case of one of the staff members or one of the teams and it comes to the point where it's raising concern. 
it's possible that in a moment like that, we're just talking about human failure. Like maybe Forrest just ran out of gas and didn't live up to the ends as much as he's charged to do, or maybe we didn't stay within our limitations. But this is where review of the ends and the executive limitations become very important. It's also possible that the problem lies in miscommunication between the people who have designed the policy governance manual and the way that the policy governance manual is written and then the way the policy governance manual is read and what expectations come out of that. So there's sort of the expectations going in and the relationship to the expectations coming out. And when that happens, one of two things could go wrong. One is that the implementation could have been a disappointment. Maybe we on the staff didn't live out a synod end the way you had imagined we would. And so then if that's the case, it's worth asking whether the way that I interpreted the language of the synod ends was reasonable and took a direction that even though it wasn't what you expected, it was a direction that could be understood as appropriate given the language that is in the ends. And then the question is, does that mean that the end as written didn't actually reflect what the people who are designing the ends have in mind for what the synod should be up to in that part of the synod's work. And if that's the case, then a rewrite of a given synod end or a secondary end is in order so that there's less ambiguity next time, so there's less probability of disappointment next time. You can imagine that if a disappointment is an expectation that is unmet, sort of a sin of omission, then the other possibility is that the implementation could be alarming, that it's a sin of commission. And the thought that would be going through your mind in that moment is, I'm sure that we all understood that that was not supposed to happen. And then again, it's worth looking at what is actually being written down in the executive limitations. The question then is, was my interpretation of the limitations and the kind of marching orders that I gave to the staff reasonable given how the limitations are written? And if it was potentially reasonable, then the question of course becomes, were they clear and precise enough to communicate what you really didn't want to have happen? Or was there something about them that left the door open for a problem behavior to occur? So notice then that in each case, we're talking about two settings, the ends and the executive limitations. And we're also talking about interpretation, both in terms of what you all are expecting vis-a-vis -vis the language that's written down and what I'm interpreting in order to implement the language or in order to stay within the limits that you expect. So this is a really critical part of the work of the Governing Commission is to go back over the language repeatedly and say, is this saying what we think it's saying? Is it producing the kind of results that we are hoping it produces? And is it preventing the kind of results that we don't want to see it produce? And so the governing, the policy governance manual puts it this way, the Governing Commission delegates authority to the Senate executive for the development and implementation of means to achieve the ends. This delegation defines not what the executive can do, 
but the limitations on his or her actions. So you say what we're trying to accomplish, and then I go out and figure out what we might do in order to accomplish that. And you also tell me, okay, in order to accomplish this, these are things that you can't do. And then I say, great, I'll do everything else. And we'll see where it goes. And with that delegation, then I get to bring it to life. And this, okay, is actually why we have executive limitations, right? So that you as the governing commission can make sure that I don't become a mad scientist with the things that the Senate is doing. Better to think of it this way. You routinely monitor the activities of the Synod and you make connections with the people that the Synod is designed to serve in order to assure that the Synod is doing what it sets out to do. And when that happens, freedom looks, instead of like Gene Wilder, it looks like a dog off the leash running very happily on the beach. So let's put it all together now. I'm gonna bring it on home in this one final sequence of slides. This is, I think, a very helpful graphic. And it's one that I didn't create, I inherited it, but I think it gets it really right. And so it goes like this. The 16 presbyteries, in conversation with their congregations, business folks would call these the owners, are represented at the synod level by commissioners to the synod assembly. And that assembly discerns the synod's vision for and delegates power to the governing commission, which does three things. It defines the ends that will fulfill the vision the assembly has discerned. It sets limits on the executive's activities in implementing the ends. And then it empowers the executive who works personally and through the synod staff and various teams to bring the ends to life for the benefit of the 16 presbyteries who in this instance then are understood as beneficiaries for the sake of their ministry to their congregations and minister members. And then the executive's progress toward the ends and compliance with the limitations is monitored by the governing commission who as necessary adjusts the ends and the limitations or calls for change in the executive's actions and then reports back to the Senate Assembly where the work starts all over again. And so you see yourselves on two sides of this wheel with three roles. One is defining the goals and setting the limits monitoring progress and compliance, progress toward the goals and compliance with the limits, and then reporting back to the folks for whom all of this is done, who are represented by the commissioners to the Senate Assembly. That's what you're here for. And as once again, like I said last year, I'm looking forward to working with you in this uh, way of doing leadership in the coming year.